Hello everyone and welcome to the game of the day, day number 7 already at the Chess24 Legends of Chess event. Uh, today I picked a game as the game of the day between Magnus Carlsen and Peter Svidler. Uh, they were both doing really well in the standings, they had a really hard fought match, uh, some very good games. And uh, I thought one of them should be the game of the day. Uh, there were a lot of decisive games today. And for example, in the match between Ivanchuk and Kramnik, saw a lot of fireworks. Uh, but I thought the games, you know, a few of them were decided kind of by larger mistakes by one of the players. While this game I thought had some really interesting, interesting moments. And uh, I may not have picked the game that you thought because I didn't necessarily pick the decisive game today. Um, and so I always try to pick games that I think are are both interesting, but also have things that we can all learn about. Uh, as we go through the analysis, I try to pick a, a selection of different openings, and I hope you do enjoy it. Uh, by the way, we have a couple of amazing promotions. Uh, so if you are not a premium member, this Legends of Chess event is a great opportunity to become a premium member. You have a choice between a 40% off discount, uh, or you can also, sign, we just created a new code called uh, Simul, that will give you the opportunity to play one of the legends of the tournament, um, and those are, you know, only the legends that are in the tournament. This is not, uh, this is not, this not going to be like one of the Chess Twenty Four employee as a legend. It's really you're going to get to play Magnus or Peter Zvidler, uh, just one of the legends when they have a simul. So uh, that's using the code simul. You sign up for two years and you get this, which is really a priceless. You know, people pay pay hundreds of dollars alone just to get a chance to play Magnus in a simul. So I think. This is actually a really pretty awesome uh, promotion, so check it out. Um, all right, so without further ado, let's get started here. Uh, Magnus in this game plays e4, and Magnus in this match today played e4 once, d4 once. I'll say it again, it's it's so hard to prepare against an opponent that plays both e4 and d4, and really in Magnus's case also knight f3, c4, he plays everything. So uh, renders preparation, it means that your your openings have to be up to snuff. You can't... You can't just make it up as you go. You also don't have time to prepare against every possibility. So you really just have to have a solid repertoire. Of course, Peter Svidler is an incredible, an incredible player, and he does. So he plays e5 here, knight of three, knight c6, and they play a Ray Lopez. We've seen a lot of a lot of Italians in this tournament. I actually looked at his statistics. In this tournament, we've seen about um, about the same number of Italian versus uh, Ray Lopez. So it's been very closely closely matched. They're both very popular. Uh, Peter Zwidler plays a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castles, bishop e7. And now uh, Magnus plays d3. I think uh, doesn't necessarily want to give the opportunity for black to play the marshal, right? Which, uh, you know, Peter would probably play if he played, uh, if he played uh, rook e1, bishop b5, bishop b3, uh, castles, he would probably play. Magnus, of, of course, has had some games here. Um, but especially in rapid i don't think magnus very often will go into a mainline marshal so he plays d3 and we'll talk we'll go through a few moves and then i'll talk about the subtleties of playing this move uh black plays b5 so d3 does already kind of threaten to take the pawn here right like versus when you play um yeah well once once you defend the e pawn basically that becomes a threat 
So b5, bishop b3, d6. So now um, white is committed to playing d3, but black doesn't have, it doesn't have as much bite to play a martial gambit. c3, castles, rook e1. And now it's interesting because uh, black plays knight a5, bishop c2, c5. And so now we get a position that, that's very reminiscent of the Chigorin defense. And in the Chigorin defense, normally we reach the exact same position uh, as after the next move, white plays d4. The only difference is white is actually down a tempo, and that tempo is that normally with the usual move order, white has played h3. Uh, and you would think that h3 is at least not a bad move for white. It's useful in some cases uh, and potentially useless or doesn't do much in some cases, but it's rarely it's rarely going to be a, a bad one. There, there are some sort of rare possibilities where it could be. Uh, so it's interesting that Magnus goes for this position down a tempo. There, a lot of players have played this from, uh, um, you know, 2,700 plus players. I saw a bunch of games. So it is very interesting. And in reality, it doesn't actually seem to matter too much whether the pawn is on h3 or not. In the games that I looked at, you know, you go five, ten more moves and you're like, do I prefer the pawn on h3? And in reality, it doesn't change too much. Um, but I did want to show you, um, if we go back a few moves, when I was saying on bishop e7, rook e1 being the, the main, um, at least the old main line, if we go into the Chigorin this way, I'll just show you for comparison. So we get this position, this is the main line, and then there's actually a ton of theory with very similar plans as we'll see in this game. So, all right, so we're moving now to the pawn being back on h2. Black plays knight d7. That's one of the ways to play the Chigorin. You can do, there's a lot of different things. You can do cd, cd, knight c6. Uh, you can make a bishop move. There's a lot of different options. Uh, but knight d7 is one of the moves. Now Magnus takes on c5, which is one of the ways to play for an advantage. Uh, it's sort of a quieter, safer way to play uh, in a way, but it suits Magnus's uh, style quite well because it, it leads to, to positions where it's... Um, there's sort of a, a clear structure and a lot of maneuvering and a lot of important squares. It just seems to, to suit Magnus's style quite well. Pawn takes c5. You don't want to have a hole on d5 by playing this way. Um, actually, there it runs into b4. So pawn takes c5, knight d2, bishop b7, b3. Uh, b3 makes sense. In It's a bit of an odd... It's a bit of an odd variation, but b3 does two things. First, it allows you to meet c4 in some way, which would sometimes be a good sort of space grabbing move. And now you have the option either to play b4 or even to take it, uh, where then the c pawn might be weak. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is that this bishop doesn't really have a good square. It doesn't want really to come to e3 because that's fairly an effective square. Um, and, but it might, it might want to come to b2 in certain cases. So... Um, all right, so he plays queen c7, very normal, knight f1, rook f to d8. And by the way, I looked, I looked uh, when I looked at the game, it's a little bit tricky when you have an opening like this where you'll have a lot of games with the pawn on h3, not as many games with the pawn on h2. So I looked at both to kind of familiarize myself. Um, and I did find the game, which I'll switch back and forth here, with the pawn on, uh, if the pawn is on uh, h3, there was a game, for example, where Mamed Yarov played uh, rook a d8, and actually won this game here against uh, Sergei Karyakin, a very well prepared player with the white pieces, um, which indicates to me that maybe you know Magnus was sort of following this plan um, that that Karyakin had played. Um, and the game went like this, and actually White got a very good opening position here after Knight d5, although he eventually lost. So this was kind of an interesting uh, uh, pseudo pawn sacrifice, I would say. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was a game between Karyakin and uh, and Mamed Yarov where he had played rook a d8. In this game, Peter Zvidler plays rook f d8, queen e2, just like in a Karyakin game. So is it, is it better with this rook uh, or the a rook? Very hard to say, frankly. Sometimes this, you know, it's clear a rook wants to come on the open file. The other rook is kind of not sure where it wants to go yet. Um, so uh, hard to say which one is better. But here, I actually don't love uh, what Peter Zvidler did, and I think it might be um, the start of some of the issues uh, for black. He plays knight to b6, and I think the knight actually goes in the wrong direction here and doesn't have a lot of prospects. Uh, there were some games where black played knight to f6 in this kind of position, and even here, I actually feel like that might be, uh, that might be a better way to go. 
and then white can play something like knight g3 uh, and then g6 is possible and i thought that this position was actually okay okay for black it's a little easier for white to play i feel but it didn't seem it didn't seem too bad we'll see after knight b6 what happens he plays knight e3. So knight e3 is, is a knight e3 or knight g3 eyeing the f5 and the d5 square, right? So that's why he comes to e3. He would go to g3 on knight f6 because on knight f6, that knight is pressuring the pawn. So that's another reason why the knight on f6 might have been uh, better placed. So knight plays g6, which is sort of the normal response. You don't really want to tolerate that knight on f5 if you don't have to. Now Magnus plays a, a move that now we always laugh when we see it, but he plays h4. One thing about h4 is at least it indicates that h3, even if you had played h3 and then h4, it's a, it wouldn't have been a loss of temp tempo. So in a way, he's saying, you know what, I have not lost the tempo because my pawn come into h4 anyway, which is uh, kind, of, kind of funny. Uh, but interesting move, you know, white now has a lot of pieces. These bishops are pointing towards the... the pointing towards the king side. The two knights are towards the king side as well. And uh, the pawn on h4 is trying to soften things up potentially with h5. So um, keep in mind that even though it's very closed up right now, uh, with the d5 square open, at any point, white has the, the possibility of, of going to knight d5. And if black takes it, they'll open up lines, right? So those lines could very quickly become open. So, uh, Peter here plays knight c6. Normally in this Chagorin, the knight, there's a saying in chess, the knight on the rim is grim. And so the knight typically comes back. Uh, it's always sort of a, a poorly placed piece. So it comes back to c6. White plays h5. And now he plays b4. And b4 is, is interesting. I think here he doesn't have too many good plans. I don't love the knight on b6, as I mentioned before, uh, because I think his counterplay on the the Queen side is not obvious. Like if he plays c4, um, that pawn, well, right now the pawn just falls. So I think that just doesn't work. Uh, but even if he played, you know, let's say he played c4 in the last move when the pawn was protected, white just plays b4 here. And I think white's got this kind of under control here. Um, and it's not it's not going to be a good position. White, for example, can play a4, hoping to even play a5. And, um, you know, if white, if black takes, then this pawn is weak. So it just seems like white's much better here. Uh, because of the king side, you know, all the pieces aiming at the king side. So in the game, understandably, um, sorry, Peter plays b4 with the idea of weakening the d4 square. The problem is that white is actually a little bit better placed after c4, good move, to, you know, eventually he'll play knight d5, white will play knight d5, black will play knight d4. Probably both sides will have to capture that knight, and then we'll see how the bishops are, are kind of placed and why white is gonna be better in that position. So he plays knight d4, knight takes. Uh, he takes with the e pawn. I looked at taking with the c pawn, and I'm actually curious what Magnus would have done. I, I was listening to the interview, but I think I actually missed like the, the, the second where he talked about this position. But I think after knight d5 here, um, probably taking with the bishop is better. If you take with the knight, um, then I think e takes is really quite good because that bishop is is kind of staring at pawns here, so and white's bishops are very are very good. So this looks unpleasant, um, but I was looking at taking with the bishop, and then I think both captures are better for white. Uh, it was un unclear to me which one. I was curious to to know which one Magnus would have played. Uh, I think you know this one is more double edged, but. Um, white certainly seems better with these bishops pointing at the king side. That being said, you know, he, you kind of have to be careful in these positions. You never know. Sometimes black might be able to play uh, f5 somewhere. So I even looked at, so I looked at playing bishop b2, which threatens this uh, because of the bishop vis-a-vis -vis here, bishop f6, and then g4. Uh, g4 is not forced at all. This was just me kind of fantasizing about this position. And, you know, I thought it was interesting to maybe play this and queen f3, king g2, rook h1. But I don't really know. I, I think white's better, but how much better, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's also interesting to play uh, pawn. The other pawn takes on d5. Now, this one is more positional. White will just play bishop d3, bishop d2, control all of the entry points here, and hopefully, you know, maybe put some pressure, try to bring the bishop to c6, something like that. I thought white would be quite a bit better. Although, you know, I was dreaming again that maybe black would be able to put a rook on c3, get counterplay. I'm not sure. So it seems to me like white's better no matter what, but that uh, I, I feel like maybe that capture would have given black a little bit more, uh, given white a little more problems. So in a game, he plays e takes d4. 
Now Magnus plays knight d5, knight takes, pawn takes. In this position, you know the material is equal. You know, sometimes people think, you know, all the knights, have, both pairs of knights have been traded. Um, the pawn structure is fairly symmetrical. Maybe this is equal. It's not equal because white has great chances on the king side here. The black king is weak. Uh, black's bishops are already, white's bishops are already really well placed. Uh, and it's a really tough position to play. And Magnus in the post-game interview said he thought he was going to win this game in a pretty straightforward way after this. Um, so bishop f6, uh, Magnus, the threat here is to play d3. So Magnus plays bishop d3, very solid, almost automatic move. Queen d7. Uh, by the way, you can't play rook e8 here, right? You get checkmated. I'll just uh, point it out because it's cute. <clears throat> Rook takes, rook takes, king g7, and h6, a very nice uh, but typical uh, schema. So black plays queen d7 to prepare rook e8. Queen f3, he's attacking the bishop on f6, so bishop g7. Always kind of an open question whether white wants to play h6. Um, generally speaking, you know, this pawn on h5 is annoying because it's always threatening also to take, or it's it's always, you always have to have on your mind that it could take on g6. So in general, uh, unless h6 you know has a clear follow-up you'd rather keep that in your pocket just so have you have the extra option of also opening up opening up the position so he plays bishop g5 rook e8 queen f4 he's trying to control the dark squares creating ideas like bishop f6 which you know of course if the queen was were to be on f6 then h6 would become a real threat bishop f8 bishop f6 so rooks get traded, but it doesn't really solve black's problems, right? And it's not just the king side. There's also that this pawn is actually a weakness. White's, the, the um, what do you call it? The phalanx, I guess, of the pawn chain here is all the way back on a2, which is in pretty much an unreachable square. While this pawn on c5 can actually be reached by a, by a bishop or a queen in some cases pretty easily. So that's another reason why white is so much better. Knight plays king f1, uh, not letting the queen come to e1. Bishop c8, bishop e5, uh, creating a very strong threat of queen f6, queen d8, bishop f6. So he, they repeat here one time. Uh, it's actually interesting that um, Peter didn't actually try to repeat. Not that white was going to repeat for sure, but he could have He could have tried and see what white would have done. Instead, he goes here, <clears throat> uh, h6. Now, this was a little bit tricky, by the way, by Magnus. Um, allowing, almost allowing to, to uh, play g5, which would look like it lose a bishop. However, he does have queen e4 with queen h7, so a little bit of a uh, little bit of sneakiness here. Um, but he did provoke h6, and the question is whether that was good or bad. Um, but actually, <clears throat> I did want to point out that uh, if you look at it with the computer, again, it's much easier for a human. This move is not at all obvious, but uh, white did have very strong move d6 here, and um, for a human, it's hard because it looks like you're sometimes risking to lose this pawn to f6, you know, which you don't really want to give up your past pawn. So uh, really not easy. But the idea is I'll show some of the some of the variations here. So first of all, in f6, uh, we simply play bishop f6, queen takes d6. And now bishop e5 is actually really strong, but there's an even cuter move, bishop e4. I like that one. That's one of the reasons I wanted to make sure to show this variation with a um, sort of puzzle-like mate here with the, the two bishops. Um, of course, this is not four, so on bishop e4, black would play, say, this. But now the position somehow just crumbles. Bishop e5 attacking the queen. And because the bishop was forced to come to e6 to stop that check, now this pawn is not defended, so things just kind of fall apart here after h takes g6. And um, surprisingly, there's not too much. After f6, it basically loses. So instead of f6, you know, on the strong move d6, black could play something like bishop e6. But now hg is very strong. And the reason is that h takes g6 allows queen h2. And this is very hard for a human to see, I think, because you're threatening queen h8. And then, so bishop g7 is not a very desirable move because we can take, take, this Magnus would see, but there's something sneaky here, which is that on f6, which uh, which looks quite good, there's a very strong bishop takes g6 threatening mate, which actually wins kind of the house here. So d6 would have been a, a very strong move. Um, Magnus here went for, for this and not quite as clear. Uh, now black plays bishop g7, Again, g5, there was queen e4, so bishop g7 is a normal move. Bishop e7 here, so he's trying to uh, uh, 
um, either push his pawn or attack the c5 pawn. And now Peter's Biddler, is, his position is really looks like it's on the verge of collapsing. And he finds one last resource, which is amazing. Peter is a very resourceful uh, defender, very tough to finish. In fact, you know, Magnus uh, was kind of better in the first three games of this match without being able to win one. And um, yeah, so here Magnus takes on g6. That move is is the move. And now Peter plays bishop f5. And that might have been underestimated by Magnus here. Um, and he's he actually has a win here, but uh, but it's really not obvious at all. <clears throat> and so um, in the game, Magnus plays g takes f7. So we'll look at that next. Now the winning move was very counterintuitive because it's actually allowing black to keep the material even, and it seems to give them counterplay. But the winning, watch this one, was to take on f5, queen takes f5, and now only move to win g3. Really weird move because if you're a human, you're like, okay, my pawn on g6, first of all, it's tempting to take with check, right? But you can't take with check, and we'll see the difference. If we take first, uh, king takes, and then play g3, it doesn't work because of our bishop. So now there's a, uh, actually, no, it's not, it's not exactly, is it this? Queen b1 here? No, it's not queen b1, sorry. Here it's actually d3, and this pawn is very, very uh, strong. <clears throat> but amazingly, if we play g3 first, um, then on d3, instead of taking this f pawn, we actually take this pawn. And so now our bishop is defended, and what the difference is that if d2, we're th actually threatening checkmate on d8, and then on other moves, like the queen can actually come back to either f4, um, and even this pawn can sometimes be stopped with a king. Somehow it all just works. Uh, it's pretty pretty wild actually. So I looked at f takes g6, and then queen f4, and somehow you know uh, the queen is actually forced to go to a bad square, and suddenly white white has two pass pawns and just going to win. So, but this is really really hard, you know, to play bishop f5. Queen f5, and then not take on f7, not play d6, not take on c5, but play g3, so that on queen b1, you can play king g2. The queen here covers the e4 square, so there's no second check. And then on d3, <clears throat> this is crazy, actually. There's this move queen to e4, which makes it really hard for white, for black to push their pawn, because they, you know, the pawn is pinned, and if you go to c1, then you lose this one. So you've got to go to d1, but that's a terrible square because you're blocking your own pawn. And then, you know, white can just play d6, d7 and win. So very tough. But Magnus plays the most natural here, g f7, king f7, queen h5, thinking that he probably has chances to win this opposite colored bishop endgame. But Peter Zvidler, um, super solid, uh, I guess very quickly realized that he can actually hold this. And the best way to show that this can be held is by actually looking, looking at the moves that are played <clears throat> so uh, Magnus tries first to try to bring the king to h5, but uh, Peter Zvidler is going to play king g5, stopping that. So he plays f4, king f6, comes here. Now uh, Peter just waits by keeping, very important, keep the bishop on this diagonal. And what this does is that whenever Magnus plays king h5, king g7, he's not able to create the passed pawn that he wants without this pawn falling. So he's forced to go back. Um, <clears throat> so in the game here, <coughs> pardon me, um, they start shuffling a little bit. Eventually, uh, Magnus goes for a plan that was mentioned by Rustam, actually, which was that maybe white can do something like get the king to b2, play a4, which will... Uh, you know, black won't want to take because we can actually just put it on the board. Um, let's say black just did king f6, a4. If he takes, takes, then the king will, will come here and at least he's going to win another pawn. That, now it's probably winning for, for white. So, um, but the idea of a4 would be to then somehow bring the king back and then um, maybe sacrifice a pawn and swing the king back to a6. It's actually unlikely that this would, uh, this would work, but it would be an attempt. However, when, when White's king got here to, um, to b2, uh, Peter played h5, very accurate, bishop d7, h4. Pawn takes king h5, so he trades, um, he trades one pair of pawns, and now this f pawn just gets blockaded. <clears throat> so if, uh, if f6 
well, he does play f6, king e5, f7, king f4. And the problem is that um, this black king acts as a shield. And so the white king will never be able to go forward. So we'll look at the moves here. But this was beautiful, beautiful technique by Peter here, just uh, now shouldering the king. So whenever he's going to shuffle the bishop around like this, just going back and forth. And meanwhile, whenever the white king uh, threatens to go one way, he's going to shoulder it here he doesn't actually the king's not threatening to go anywhere that way so he could just keep keep shuffling so really the only square he needs to shuffle to is f4 and g3 so it's it's quite quite easy uh nothing that white can do at this point if white managed to play a3 or a4 it wouldn't do anything uh black can just ignore it and take back and there's no there's no entry point right you can't can't go in so just a draw so really impressive of peters villar to to manage to hold this game uh, and I thought this game had a little bit of everything, and that's what I that's what I look for for in the game of the day. Not always necessarily the number one most exciting finish, but a combination of of interesting tactics, interesting plans, and uh, interesting opening. So I hope you've enjoyed this game of the day. By the way, if you're wondering, Magnus did win this match by winning the fourth game with the white pieces, uh, and they actually got another opposite colored bishop position uh, end game. So interesting that uh, that they got a couple of these. And, um, and yeah, this was a hard, pretty hard fought match. And Peter, Peter Svidler's got to be pretty happy with his performance so far. He's in a, a decent uh, position to potentially qualify. And so hopefully, and hopefully he does. Um, and, uh, but yeah, right now at the top of the standings, you have Magnus and Jan Nepomneshi with a pretty, pretty dominant uh, tournament so far. And then everything else is kind of up in the air. Although Anish Giri has also done well and he's maybe the favorite to get the third spot. And then we'll see between... Kramnik's Fiddler or, or potentially someone else. So, uh, well, thanks again for tuning in and uh, I will see you all tomorrow.